everybody. Thank you for uh, coming to our, this is our first uh, music department sponsored event of the semester, the first of many. Um, and this is actually going to be the first of a three part uh, workshop series. So come back next week and the week after for more. Um, and it's really my pleasure this week to uh, introduce you to Larry DeVoskin. Uh, from Cool Guy Music, he's been nominated for four Grammys, sold millions and millions and millions of albums and things, and so he's going to talk to you about songwriting and what it means, how to do it, talk about ideas. So, Larry, thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you all for coming. Um, I was explaining to Melanie before that my parents were both teachers. So in New Jersey, where I grew up, my mom was a second grade school teacher for 30 years. My father, a sixth grade school teacher. So when I was most of y'all's age, I swore whatever I would do in life, I would never teach. So, you know, it's like the mafia. It's like once you're in the teaching, they try to get out, it pulls you back in. And uh, so it's really an honor and a privilege to share with you some of the insights listen to music, talk, inspire each other. Uh, I've been doing this a long time. I was signed to my first record label at age 18, RCA. I lived like the movies Spinal Tap and Almost Famous, touring in front of famous groups that wore ridiculous trousers and had like bad haircuts. And uh, then was signed as a songwriter to Warner Chapel music, to famous music, various other things along the way. Uh, I've worked with, I've toured with some of the rock and roll greats like the Allman Brothers and Tom Petty and Queen. I've written songs with a lot of the rock and roll legends like Robert Plant or Jimmy Trick or Bad Company. Uh, what I'm doing right now, a lot of people teach and there's sort of a, uh, a cliche that's unfair toward both teachers and students where they say those who can't teach. Meaning like if you can't make it as a trumpet player, you teach jazz at a college or something like that. But I really find that in, in today's age, there's a sort of synergy happening, and the internet is part of it, where people really directly connect, and the lines between us and them are, are being broken down. And so there's no more them, there's only us. And so I find teaching is, is a really wonderful thing. I myself am working on a record with one of the Beach Boys, Al Jardine, so we're getting Jason Mraz to come in, we're getting Rob Thomas to come in, I'm doing a voiceover with Alec Baldwin. And forgive me for name dropping, but it's it's just to show you that, you know, here in New York, you can, anything's possible, you can connect with the biggest people. There's an equation that success equals opportunity equals preparation. It's like a E equals MC squared. Success equals opportunity and preparation. So being here in a class and listening is like the preparation. And then the opportunity is just next time you're on the subway, you're in the street, you're at the bitter end, you're somewhere, you just bump into someone and they say, you know, I'm working on this movie, I really need this reggae song. And you're like, boom, here it is. And you're ready. Um, I wanted to... Um, share with you a quote that somebody I do yoga with, Russell Simmons, always says, and it's, he signs every email and every text and every letter with the quote, with great love, all things are possible. And I find that with songwriting and with life, like whatever you really love, whatever you're really drawn to, there is a power greater than yourself that is irresistible, that brings you to some Conclusion. I remember, I worked with Brandy for a while, and I remember a story that her mom told me or something like this, where they were just, when she was like really young, they were at some concert, and they were like, like at Madison Square Garden or someplace, the LA Forum, just trying to get like a CD to whoever was playing. They were standing at the security gate, and there was some big guy saying, you know, forget, you know, oh, are you kidding? And they were just like so hungry to get Brandy's music out there, that they would just do anything. They'd stand there right at the gate, like trying to get music. And it's no wonder that maybe that instance didn't lead to anything, that years later, as a teenager, she was having hit records. Um, another example is a friend of mine named Elliot Tiber 
was, uh, wrote a book called Taking Woodstock. And about two or three years ago, he went to Hollywood and thought, the 40th anniversary of Woodstock is coming, it's August 09. You know, this is gonna be a big thing, it's a worldwide event. We've gotta make my movie about how the Woodstock Festival happened and all the people who tried to stop it and they didn't want the music to happen. And he went with ICM and all these big agents and he couldn't sell the movie. Like every single person passed. And he told me Disney optioned it for 24 hours, like whatever that means. It's like for 24 hours they made the movie. And so he came back dejected and he was doing a television interview at five in the morning in San Francisco for his book. And in walks Ang Lee, the director of uh, Brokeback Mountain and Crouching Tiger and all these great movies. And Ang Lee's like, what are you doing here? And he said, well, as a matter of fact, I have this thing. And it's about what happened to help Woodstock. And it, it, my book ends when the festival starts. And by the way, here's my screenplay and script. And so, and this is a true story, and it's, it inspired me that anything's possible. It, it uh, you know, he just thought, like, no one's going to do my movie, blah, 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 and he moves to Florida, and he gets a call about a month later saying, we're flying to New York right away, they're doing the movie, they're rushing it out, never before in nine months are they going to rewrite the screenplay, cast the movie, go into production, edit it, and release it to hit August 2009, and they want you to come right away. And he came back to New York, and in some airline hangar, at the airport, the entire staff of Focus Features was there, and there were big pictures on the wall of his whole family and his life, that some of which they were like, how did you get those? It was like that, that Charlie Wilson's War. There's a movie that they're honoring him, and they have all these pictures of it. And it just showed me that he did by himself what ICM couldn't do, which is one of the biggest agents, which is just, he was prepared, and when the opportunity came, he was just right there. Here's my, it's not like I'll call you or I'll send it back. So, you may ask, um, a lot of people say, oh, you know, how am I gonna do this? Like, you watch the MTV Music Awards and you see Taylor Swift and Kanye and Madonna and you know Cobra Starship and all these people and say like, well, they're them and then there's little old me doing this. And I, I wanna share with you something that, that is really a truth that I found that makes this room such a special room and all of you such special people. And that is in every other endeavor. You know, I had dinner with a guy who is a neuroscientist at Columbia. And so he's obviously a genius because he's studying how to make like these chips that like have artificial intelligence. And so he really studied and got straight A's and a 4.0 average and worked like a maniac to do his job. But it's the person who, it's a housewife from North Carolina who wrote the words, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. And it's a singing waiter from the Lower East Side in the early 1920s who later wrote, I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy, and also I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. And it's reported that a slave ship owner from the 15th century had an epiphany and wrote the words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound to save a rich like me. So in every other field of endeavor, there is a kind of expertise and scholastic excellence that needs to happen. But songwriters, we're like, you know, the people who are voted least likely to succeed in high school, you know? And it's the guy who is stuffed in the garbage can by his nuns at parochial school who becomes known as the boss, Bruce Springsteen. You know, it's the guy who's the loser in Seattle who becomes Kurt Cobain. So the inspiration here is that, um, especially with the internet, there, anything is possible now. There's really no limits because you can actually go and talk to people. And so we're gonna explore two things in this seminar. We're gonna explore the art of songwriting. And we're, we're, we're not, you know, there are lots of different types of writing. There's classical orchestrations, there's rap, there's all this. We're going to actually look at words and music. Like, when you go to a music store and you buy sheet music, it doesn't say beats by, it doesn't say string section by, it just says words and music. So we're going to really focus on the main sort of highway of what popular music writing is. And then we're also going to look at the business of it. 
and how you um, can get out there and get your stuff heard. And so it's, it's like these two different heads. One is like I'm being an artist and being creative, and the one is I'm out there sort of looking for opportunities and, and hooking my stuff up. So that's what we're going to study in this. And um, I'd like to ask, how many of you are looking to be performers, like where you write and perform your own music? Can you raise your hand? OK. And how many of you are looking to just take some creative ideas you have and turn them into songs, and maybe someone else will record them or whatever else? OK, so it's kind of mixed. And how many of you are just here because you're curious about the class and wanted to know more about it? OK. So it's kind of mixed. And so there's going to be something for everyone. Uh, because this class is, is an introduction, I, I'm going to really start first with the music side. Because before you get into the business head and the hustle, if the music isn't there, it's sort of like trying to sell a pie that you haven't cooked properly yet. You've got to cook the pie, and that's the song itself. The first thing we're going to look at is melody. And again, this is different than um, classical composition. This is different than rap. This is just looking strictly at why there are certain melodies of songs that stick out and stick in your head that are different than other songs that kind of come and go. Like, what, what makes a successful melody? Why do people gravitate towards something that they hear? And so I have a theory, which I will call my tension and release theory, that explain, and I'll try to explain it to you in visual terms. If, if you go see the movie Star Wars, and, you know, Luke Skywalker and his family are living happily, and they're just kind of in their house and they're farming. Like, after a while, the movie would be boring. But in comes, you know, Darth Vader and the Death Star and the Stormtroopers, and they're chasing, you know, the last of the Jedi. And, and there's this dance of conflict and resolution. Conflict and resolution. It's, it's like a fist, it's closed and then it's open. It's closed and then it's open. It's similar to the breath. There's an inhale, there's an exhale. So music is the same way. Music has a conflict and a resolution. And, and built into that, it's not something that, let's say, people consciously think about, like, I'm going to build tension and release into this chorus. It's more like a thing you just hear in songs and, and subconsciously and intuitively gravitate toward. So the example that I'm going to give you is we've all heard the the sound of music, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, which is the main notes of a major scale. Everybody kind of has heard that, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so. So in that scale of eight notes, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, there's a chord that's, that's plucked. And in that chord, there are three notes, um, the first, the third, and the fifth. So if I sing a note and it's I'm following the chord along. But what happens if I do, if I sing a note that's outside of that chord? Like the it, it sounds dissonant or weird. It, it, it sounds like it's not complete. So Sometimes what songwriters will do, and again, this is an intuitive process. It's not necessarily something you think about consciously. But sometimes what songwriters will do is they'll use a note that's outside the chord, and it just kind of gives it that, you know, the Jedi versus Darth Vader kind of like back and forth. And the case in point is the song Yesterday by Paul McCartney. Uh, the first note is an F, but vocally, the first note that he sings is a G. Yesterday. Now, if I play just the, the root of the chord against the note, yeah, yeah, yesterday, it, it almost sounds like a mistake. But if I play the chord and then just go yesterday, it suddenly sounds beautiful. And I know that Paul McCartney didn't really plan on this, but it just sort of happened. The next note, the word all, all, 
this is a note that is an A, and I don't know how many of you can see this, but the chord around it has a G and a B. So it, again, it's the same thing. It's like, oh, but if I play the chord, oh, my trouble seems so far away. And even the word far away, it's an E note right next to an F note. Far So it constantly has a fist that's closed. Far, far away. From tension to release, tension to release. It's like a dance. And I had the opportunity at one point to actually sit down with Paul McCartney and, um, or actually, really, I just lunged at Paul McCartney in the Hamptons. And I said, I use your tension to release theory in my class. And he was like, what are you talking about? And I explained this and he said, you know, I've always, known that, but I, you're a braver man than I to try to explain it. So does everybody kind of hear what I'm, uh, it's a hard thing to explain, but what it is is you have these notes in the chord and then you use the other notes outside of the chord. You know, even in, in R and B, baby love of my baby. It's a six. It's a it's a D note against a C. So it's really not tied to a specific time. It's not tied to a specific group. It's just a, a pop application. And what it does is it just creates the melody. Now let's say I didn't want to do tension or release. Let's say I just wanted to kind of follow the chords. I could write a song that goes. Yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. Now it looks as though they're here to say, Oh, God, I really yesterday. And that's sort of like following the chord of them. That, if you had never heard the first version, you'd think, Well, that sounds pretty, it's nice. But it doesn't have that. Je ne sais quoi, that cinematic specialness that that other melody has. It. Yesterday, oh my trouble seemed so far away. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. Oh, I believe in yesterday. It just has this sound to it, that, that, and it also has a longing. You know, there's a saying that unrequited love is the most potent, the most like pure form of love because it's not, it's like Romeo and Juliet, it's not quite there. It's like the glimpse of it is there, the taste of it is there. And so yesterday is like one of those weird songs where it's not really sad completely and it's not really happy, it's longing for something. And by touching that, that um, emotion of longing, you touch upon something very, very powerful because we're all trying to get back to the Garden of Eden. We're all trying to get back to a moment of feeling wholeness that in our world is really fleeting. It doesn't exist. Some people try to find it with money. Some people try to find it with work or career or success or something. And then you achieve that milestone and you're like, what's next? So does anyone have any questions about the tension and release things specifically. And then we're going to move on to chord progressions after this. Is that when, when you write the lyrics, um, yeah. you can also make use of that too, right? So yeah. like that tension and release. Yeah, and, um, and did everybody hear the question? Yeah. Okay, so I'll repeat it. And it's just something, if you can hear me, just all, always like, if I'm speaking too low for a minute, just kind of go like that. He asks, when people are writing the lyrics, then they try to fit that into the tension and release thing. And, and the answer is yes. And very often, there's a difference between poetry and there's a difference between lyrics. Next week, we're going to get into lyrics big time. And the thing that's different is, is that lyrics are going along at a certain beat per minute. You know, they're, they're moving because the song is moving, whereas poetry 
you can sit and read each person at their own pace. Some people read through it very fast, some people read slow, you can linger on a word. But lyrics are basically, you know how a TV commercial is a short little movie, lyrics are like a short little poem. They, they just say something in two sentences, like yesterday, love was such an easy game to play, now I need a place to hide away. They say what you could say, you could say a whole book and sum that up in two sentences. And that, that's just how lyrics are. They're kind of summations. Like, it's actually pretty good that people are tweeting now because tweets are like lines in a lyric. You don't have time and room to just go on and on forever. You have to kind of get to the point. So, um, so lyrics are, do need to be finessed in. And some people write from one standpoint or the other. Elton John gets a lyric from Bernie Taupin, and then he sits at the piano and figures out what the music is. And then some people, like Madonna, get a track, and then over the track she hears in her head with the melody and lyrics. So there's no one way of writing. It's each person is different. Was there another? I just, I just love how you go look at the piano, play the bass itself, the chords of the song, and I hear the whole song. And to me, that's like a really interesting testament of how the song is, uh, is, is simple in the way that it's probably written. And it doesn't, it's not about the production, it's just really about the essence of the song. And the fact that I walk in, you're just kind of doing three or four notes, not looking at the piano, just because you can do it, it's very impressive to me. Oh, well, it's really that, as, as he was saying, good songs are very, very simple. Um, they don't really, the production is a sort of making of the movie, but the actual story is the song. And so if you have a good story, no matter what film you make, you can make many different films from that one song. Like, the next song we're going to look at, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, um, I forgot the name of the artist, but there's a Hawaiian version that some of you uh, have I heard. And that Hawaiian version with like a little kind of reggae feel, I mean, it's hot. And that is the testament of a great song that, that a century later, or I should say 70 years after it was written, somebody comes along and does it, and it's just as hot as the original, and it brings it to a whole new generation. That's what we strive for. Like, people listen and say, oh, well, I heard, you know, Slipknot do this rock song, I can do it better. I heard Ludacris do this rap, and I can do it better. You want to be yourself. You know, you don't want to like copy what other people are doing. Just being genuine, just being yourself is enough, and just telling your story is enough. So, moving from the tension and release melody thing, I want to move to the next subject, which is another application. And, and mind you, the reason why there are so few songwriting instructors, which it, I'll just tell you right it, as my Disclaimers, for every rule I give you, there's going to be something you can point to and says, well, that breaks the rule. So music is one of those contradictory things that there are, what I notice, there are patterns that people use, but those patterns are not absolute. This is the rule you have to follow. You have to kind of intuitively find your own vibe, your own sound. So the next thing that I found is just like you look at the New York Post and the New York Times and there's a headline like, you know, Kanye is a jerk or something, you know, and you, you find the news of the day. So in melody do you find sometimes these headline melodies. And what I mean by headline melodies is that the use of notes is so big and so dramatic that it just grabs your attention. You're like, wow, what did that person just sing? Holy mackerel. So the, the example of that is some um, word jumps 12 semitones. Somewhere. And right away you're like, whoa, what's going on there musically? That is like just jumping off the cliff with no parachute. Um, and it, it really grabs your attention. And lyrically, they're talking about a rainbow. It's this big bridge-like, arc-like thing in the sky. So right off the bat, the first word, the first note, just jumps off the cliff and goes, Somewhere over the rainbow way. And even the word up, up high. They were clever enough to put 
with the up, up. And so that song doesn't have the same tension and release, but it has something else going on for it, which is it's in big letters. The melody is like, pay attention to me. This is a big song coming at you. And so this is not tense. This is the first note of the chord. And this is the eighth note of the chord, which is the octave. And then this is in the chord. And then this one note here is the first tension note. Over the rainbow. That, that note is a C against the B. Over the rainbow. So it just is like a, you know how you hear those classical songs and they go like, you know. You know, it's that little like thing that's the tension cliffhang. So it's over the rainbow. And then it resolves into the chord again, way up high. And again, it just has a kind of flow to it. There's a man that I heard of once in a la la. And that word, ah, ah, ah. And so it's mostly in the chord, except for a few little moments, but it's so, Broad, you know, it's sort of like Elton John did that a lot. You go like, and that leap is like, man, like he must have had like tight underpants or something when he was a kid because. It's way the heck up there. And this is all the chords. And so those notes are all in the chord, but it's so theatrical. The notes are really, really theatrical. And so it grabs your attention. You know, I used to, when I first started writing songs, uh, uh, like everyone, you know, you write your first song, you think, this is it. It's you know, and I, I used to write these songs and I, you know, I woke up and asked it was gray, so I went to the floor that day, and I saw this girl standing there at the lake, and I went to her and decided to say, and you know, I thought that was really good, and then I turned around and my friends would be gone, and like, everybody would be like, out of the room, and so I, Hum, was humble into realizing that uh, maybe I needed to work on the song a little more. And so you could take something like that and you can put it like finesse and go, It's a lot more melancholy, but it has like a it has something in it. There's some kind of like strange melodic voodoo going on. And I could riff endlessly on things I could do to those same lyrics and chords, but that's just an example of before and after. And then some songwriters will do two different things. They'll actually put like a big theatrical leap with the tension and release. And Bacharach and David, um, who were really big songwriters in the 50s and 60s, Dion Warwick, and they wrote that great song, What the World Needs Now, is Love, Sweet Love. They, they would have very powerful classic kind of melody. So they would do a song like, From Close to You, a song by the Carter Brothers. Uh, the first two notes would be in the chord, it would be, Why do? And then the word birds is just like the same note as yesterday. It's right outside of the chord. Why do birds? It's a D note against the C chord. The C chord has C, E, and G in it, and then the, the word birds is a D. So birds suddenly appear. So again, it goes from in the chord to out of the chord. but they're, they're moving up a one-third fifth, so it gives it 
that big head body. And then again, in the court, just and out of the court. And so it's a dance between headline notes, intention, and release. If I wanted to write, again, if I was, let's say, rewriting it and writing out the tension release, I might go, Why do, why do birds I can't even do it. it. It's actually hard to do because I'm so used to hearing it the other way. So again, different people do different things. You know, there are different pop applications of this. The I Will Always Love You song by Whitney Houston, you know, starts out an octave lower and she's singing pretty low and then she hits that chord. And it has the same kind of headline effect because the whole rest of the song, she's kind of low and like da 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 and then it's like blasting into outer space and you, you get it. So, are there any questions about this? We, we've looked at two things, the tension and release and the bold headline melody that jumps around. And, uh, and we've looked at a bunch of examples from different eras. So, are there any questions about this? Can you touch on the, um, as, as far as with the notes, the pitches, but what about the rhythm content? Yeah, and that's a really good question. Uh, what he said is we've touched on the notes and the key and very, uh, various things, and what about the rhythm content? And that's another aspect that is actually part of the whole equation, which is that sometimes you can have something that has a rhythm and a snap to it that may not be tension and release, and it may not be um, a big note. Uh, does everybody have the handout here that has the lyrics somewhere over the rainbow? Okay. Yeah. Could, could we give her one on these guys? Oh, and there are two people over here. So just to answer that question for a minute, we're going to actually go into this and repeat it next week. But just turn to the second page on the lyric sheet, no scrubs. So who has the... Um, who here has the audacity to want to just sing us the chorus? I don't want no scrub. Ah, did I see? All right. Can you just just stand up for a second? Just give us uh, just the chorus. I don't want no scrub. Okay. Any key. I don't want. I don't. No, we need you to sing it because we need to hear the rhythm. I don't want to sing Just the chorus. Just the where it says chorus. Okay, hold on. We, we need you to sing it. That's like, to, to us, not, not to like... Does somebody, if it's too embarrassing, is there somebody who'd like to sing it that just wants to belt it out? Okay, just just the chorus. Thank you. <laughs> you know, thanks. So, to answer your question, there's something that just has a rhythm that is so hooky and infectious, it's simple, and again, it shows that, that the reason why this is such a specialized discussion we're having, it's not really a lecture or class, it's a conversation, is that there are so many different possibilities. Music is communication, it's a story, it's a feeling, and how many different languages are there? You can communicate with a touch, you can communicate with a look, you can communicate with a gesture, you can communicate with just a signal, you can communicate with a word. And so the same thing is true of music. There's something that's just ba da ba da 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 and you're just gonna go down the street and you're gonna get like a groove on and that song is gonna be whether you know it's like a 
girl group or, you know, college student in Queens, like you're gonna get the feeling of it just singing it, you know, 15 years later. So rhythm actually is another important thing. And uh, it's another important part of the writing process. There are some songs that just have something that's just really hooky and rhythmical, like that chorus, that sell the song. I mean, that was it. When people heard that part, it didn't jump, it didn't tension and release, but it just got you moving in such a way that was so simple that everybody jumped on board that train and said, I'm gonna ride this song home. Does that answer your question? Yes. Anybody else uh, have any questions about this? melody discussion, because then we're going to move on to uh, chord patterns. Because our first thing really, and please feel free to ask questions, even if you feel like they're kind of dumb or lame, because they say successful people ask better questions. That's what Anthony Robbins says. So um, are there any other questions? OK. So now we're going to go to chord patterns. And uh, how many people brought music to play for the class as well? You do. And, um, okay, good. Because that's part of what we're going to do over this workshop is not just me talking to you, which after a while, even for me, is probably going to seem very boring, but we're going to listen to people's music. We're going to maybe, if you're willing and open to it, like make suggestions, you know, change this line, or this part's great, can you repeat it? And it's really an interactive thing that we're going to do. But the first thing we're going to do is look at um, the fact that just like certain things, just like the seasons go around in patterns, the music also goes around in patterns as well. And we're just going to, on a very basic songwriting level, look at some of these patterns. Um, in the 50s, and again, this goes back to our one, you know, our do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. You know, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And those are the notes of the scale. And let's say in the 50s, there was this near, uh, well, I would just say it was a musical obsession with a chord pattern called one, minor six, four, five. Uh, the one being, and then if we count one, two, three, four, five, six, the minor six, and then the four, two, three, four, and then the five. So all of these songs. songs, you know, if, if I put that into, you know, Now you take that same pattern and you jump forward a couple of years and it's like every breath you take, every claim you stay, every bow you break, every breath you take, I'll be watching. like Sting wasn't ripping off Benny King, it's just these, you know, I think if we had the neuroscientist that I was with last night, he'd talk about the fact that your brain has these sort of synapses and these neural things that kind of attach to each other like broccoli. And they form relationships, cigarettes, coffee, work, getting up at a certain hour. And so we're used to hearing those chords. You know, love those chords, like they're just in our brain, we're like hardwired to say, ah, is that, you know, 
And then you can also mix them up. And so it doesn't necessarily just have to be one minor six, four, five. It could be maybe one, five, minor six, four. You know, with or without you. had this whole insane like minor six four five thing where every song went you know, shut through the heart and you're to blame you give love a bad name where it was oh heaven is a place on earth there were just so many songs and all of these are variations of one minor six four five they all go back to like you know, wait a minute, Mr. Postman, wait, Mr. Postman, there's a letter, a letter for me, la la la, la 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 la, shot through the heart, and you're too late, you give love a bad name. Uh, it's weird that these little couple of chords can have hidden in them like some kind of crystal all these songs that you, you would never put wait a minute mr postman and you give love a bad name in the same sentence <laughs> but they're four chords and it's the same thing and so what it does and what it proves is is you know hank williams said country music is three chords in the truth and there's really something to that and the other chord pattern beside one minor six four five and for those of you that aren't musical uh, to actually give you the chords, let's say what we've been doing in C is the first chord is a C, and if you want to write this down. The second chord is an A minor. And the third chord is an F. And then the fourth chord is a G. And so those chords in any which way combination, you can start with the minor. the other ones or you can do it classically one minus six four five they just hold within them a familiarity to people and again I don't think people are deliberately trying to copy one another but it's just our brains are wired for familiarity it's just you know an evolutionary thing something familiar when I came back from living in Europe I was amazed at how many commercials on TV had red white and blue backgrounds just as the colors like everything was red white and blue I was like wow like this is so strange to me after living in Germany and England for a few years. So, having said that country music is three chords in the truth, there is another uh, chord pattern that I want to point out, which is just three chords, which is just leaving out the minor, you know, it's just... It's just the one, four, five. And so especially as well in the 50s, there was this, you know... A little bit you really got me now. You know, all this. You know, I'm gonna ride a little bit of a little All of this stuff is one, four, five. Um, Chuck Berry, Little Richard. Hang on, Snoopy. The Rascals in the 60s. I was feeling so sad. You know, even Kurt Cobain said that when I asked him how he wrote the song, Smells Like Teen Spirit, that defined like a generation. You know, he just said, well, it, that it was nothing original. He was just ripping off Louis Louis. And I think, you know, maybe if you're like on heroin or something, like the two songs sound similar, Louis Louis, it smells like Teen Spirit, but to the rest of us, it's a completely different thing. But I think what he was trying to explain in his altered state was this sort of like, um, 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 very similar to his bomb, 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 bomb. 
It's a sort of rhythmic, pat rhythmic chord pattern that has some similarity. Again, you have to kind of be lit up to see the connection, but um, lucky for us, we, we got Smells Like Teen Spirit, which really was a, an honest and powerful song for its time. So again, this one, four, five is just something that keeps coming around, you know. And for those of you writing it down again, who maybe don't play music, the one, four, five chords are just C, F is the four, and G is the five. And so then, and, and so then, if you add the minor six in there, you get you know more than. So again, there's something from the 70s that directly relates to something in the 50s, which next year there'll be some new buzz band on the MTV Music Awards and they'll be going. And everybody say, oh, that's so original and cool, like Cobra Starship, you know, whoever it is, the white stripe, well, you'll be saying, this is the most amazing new thing I've ever heard. So who has a question about these chord progression changes? Did you figure that out like just by listening to it the first time or like you break it down? I think it, it was it, it, it sort of is an intuitive process that takes time. And for me, you know, I've been teaching classes and seminars, so each time I teach I actually learn something myself. And so I, I think a lot of it was just accidental discovery and starting to, just starting to, you know, there was a big book last year called The Secret, and it talks about this idea of how your mind, the power of positive thinking. So whatever you focus on gets bigger. And so just by focusing on like, well, why are certain songs successful? And why are certain songs just go by the wayside, and you, you only hear them once and then they're gone? And so it's in looking at, with my magnifying glass like brain, why are these songs successful? And I started noticing these patterns. Yeah, okay, so on the, the chord pattern, especially, go back to the one. one uh, so we've got major one, the uh, minor six, and then major four and five. Uh, do these typically get paid in, you know, in versions? Or when you have first, second, those inverted forms? Is there something that's kind of stand with that, or is it just? Then that's what people deviate Did everybody hear that? He just asked if the one minor six, four, five, if people play that in its standard form or do they do inversions, which means sometimes people will do instead of this. You know, this is just, you know, bum, 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 ba -da, ba -da, da -da, dum, dum. It's heart and soul, basically, as well as you give love a bad name. So people will um, do everything. Is the answer to your question is some people will go. They'll use all different inversions of the chords. It's just that sort of chemical equation mixed around just always somehow comes out to a familiar pattern for people. Because you get different tensions. Yeah, and and you know, obviously this is one layer of the cake. So if you put the melody on top that adds a complexity to it. And then you put the words on top, whether it's a rhythmic pattern like we were talking about before, or whether it's something very smooth, it changes it. So it's like a cake with a bunch of layers. But this is sort of like, on a music level, the bottom layer. And that, that's um, the sort of foundation for it. And I forgot to play Heart and Soul. That's usually the first thing that I play on one minor six, four, five, because you learn that as a kid. And it's like the cheesiest song ever, but then you hear all these other great songs like Stand By Me that aren't cheesy at all. It's the same chords. So uh, you had a question as well? Can you, can you think of a song that, has, that was a very successful song with a very complex chord progression? Um, yeah, I mean, there are lots and lots of complex songs. Uh, for me, um, you know, MacArthur Park, you know, which kind of starts with the. Uh, Spring was never waiting for a girl. 
it back one step ahead. I can't even play it. Head as we followed in the dance. And it, it keeps changing keys and goes to Nick Arthur's Park is melting in the dark. All the sweet green icing flowing down. And it keeps jumping around key changes and parts. A lot of the Beach Boys songs are like that too, like good vibrations, which to listen to sounds like, you know, I'm picking up good vibrations. That song goes through a lot of different changes, weather patterns, minors, majors, autumns, winters. That song goes through all this very complicated stuff. And uh, there are tons of examples of that where they're also, and that's why, again, this is more of a conversation than a lecture, because country music might be three chords in the truth, and pop music might be four chords in the truth, but then there are so many examples of things that are really sophisticated, different, weird things with very complicated chord patterns to them. And uh, like Blackbird, you know, by the Beatles is a, you know, I can't even play it, but it's, it's this whole thing that moves around on the guitar neck, almost like a fugue would be um, played on an organ or something. And it's it's in some ways very simple, but if you you know don't practice it every day, like I haven't been doing, it's like you immediately can't play Blackbird, which is melodically just Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Very simple. Does that answer the question? Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, the Donna Summer version is like really cut down, but it goes from like a lot of minor chords to major sevens, and all kinds of things. Um, other questions? Uh, let me just, so I, I repeat your question, Echo. Are you saying that his own music started to sound like it? So? Yeah, similar, similar when they were like very hot. Yeah, okay, so yeah. what he was asking is that Ricky Martin, the Latin pop singer, got really hot for a while, and then his song started to take on a certain sound and style that was very similar, and is he using similar patterns? Um, and, and the answer to that, knowing like Desmond Child, who wrote La Vida Loca, who was one of my colleagues and someone I've written with, I think with him more, it's that Sony accidentally had a hit. Like they weren't expecting to have La Vida Loca be a hit. And so then they did similar to what they were doing with Michael Jackson Records, where they recorded 150 songs over a course of three years with 50 different producers, hoping to get another La Vida Loca. And so they just, by the time they reached like She Bangs, they were just really more just trying to copy La Vida Loca than actually follow a pattern. I, I think that, you know, this gets into our other discussion of the business of music, where, you know, my friend Ital Shore was called a while ago to Arista Records saying, you know, Santana's looking for music. You know, we're bringing Carlos Santana back. And he listened to all these songs that he was doing. And then he thought to himself, well, what were Carlos Santana's songs? They were all like, you know. You got to change your evil ways, you know. Baby. So he thought like that kind of groove, like, oye como va, evil ways, like that's what Santana was known for. So he went off and wrote a song, you know, uh, smooth, that had that kind of like, that ch -ch 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 thing going on. And um, so, in that case, again, it was more like less about these patterns creatively and more about the concept of like, you know, if it's a hit, throw another thing that sounds like it. And unfortunately for them, like, La Vida Loca was really an accident, uh, more than a planned thing. And then to follow up the accident, it's always like, it's like, you know, I love Borat personally, but then Bruno was like a disappointment because they were trying to do the same thing again. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it just shows you how art is a fickle mistress. It slips away the minute you blink and look the other way. And, you know, it's very rare that you have like a group like the Beatles that will follow 
I want to hold your hand and she loves you and please, please me and just have one hit after another that sounds similar and then just each song is as good as the last. You know, it's hard to do that. <laughs> Are there other questions? And um, what, what time do we have? We've got a couple minutes. Okay, does anyone have a song they want to play for us? Because I really would like to turn the floor over to y'all. I think you said you had something? Because I don't want to spend all the time just trying to plug something in. Does somebody have either a CD that we could play on a little boombox or just like want to play the piano or guitar for us? I know that you guys got some things. Don't be shy. You see, your, he's always like, I don't know. He's like, what do you have for us? <laughs>
It could be a lot. I don't know. I guess maybe um, something. It's kind of it's kind of jazzy. So I don't know. Like any R&B singer really did the well. Are you open to people just commenting on it? Or does anyone have a want to comment on the song? Or? But all oh, hope that it's safe. <laughs> Yeah, I like it a lot. It's very evocative, you know, and what's nice is even hearing it like this, and you can imagine I can almost make up lyrics for that sort of song, but it's, uh, it's, a, yeah, it's got a, a rich texture to it that's suggesting the different moods. I kind of wonder, do you have a mood in mind for the song? Is there an emotion that you would say? It's a sadness, so I guess. It's blues, you know? Do you, you have any kind of concept for the song? Or? Any kind of concept you have for the song? I'm just, just jamming on this. Do you have somebody to write for that? Hmm? Do you have somebody to write for that? Right? That's just a, that's just an instrumental jam I just wrote for a while back. I don't have anything done with it. It's nothing like... Try it's a Huh? It's a Definitely, man. You're an excellent player. I went to my guitar for press and you did it. I met you last week, but I, I didn't know you played like that. That's really wonderful playing, so I'd like to hear more. Now, um, would you be willing to let somebody from the class kind of get with you, you know, during the course of the week and maybe try to help you collaborate? Would you be willing to do that? Maybe write the top line lyrics and then you guys could come and show us what you've done. And we could learn from you by seeing the progress. We would be open to that. That's not particularly. Yeah. So is there somebody that has a, well, because you asked the question, would you guys swap phone numbers or emails before <laughs> uh, when it's done? And I'll tell you why. I'll, I'll tell you, let me try them first. It's too hard if too many people. Well, no, I was going to tell them. I don't, I don't, I don't write songs, but I produce mostly, so if you need someone to call it, then I can swap out my number too. Right. Well, all right. And I, I need to talk to you too, because I'm always hiring programmers to right. program tracks and beats, and I, I find people that I have a team and I pay to do that. So all right. yeah. if you have really fresh beats, like I'm always yeah. open to that. So yeah. um, I uh, have found in, in other classes that I've taught that you know, if you look at a painting in a museum, it's not just when you have one color on one color that it creates, it's the contrast and the conflict of reds and greens and blues and oranges that creates this sort of aliveness. And, you know, we once had this class where we had this uh, housewife who, like, wrote really, ch like, cheesy, like, housewife New Jersey lyrics. And then somehow she teamed up with this snarling, antisocial Kurt Cobain type heavy metal guitar player. And everybody in the class, we were all just holding our head thinking, oh my god, this is going to be like a plane crash when these two get together. <laughs> but instead, they wrote the most amazing stuff. Because these really cheesy lyrics against this guy's very dark and introspective uh, guitar patterns created this whole other thing that made it really cool and it somehow worked. So don't underestimate the power and the value of collaborating with people who are very different than you. Because it's sort of like you, you, you know, it's sort of like when the president has a cabinet, he wants people who think very differently than he does to add to his thinking and to add to his ideas so that he gets a well-rounded um, in information and creative approach to something. And so, you know, this gentleman asked, like, do you have someone in mind? Like, he's the right, he, like, left in there. So that's usually the right thing. And, uh, you know, and, and just so you know, it's a different discussion, and I'll, we only have a few minutes, so I'm going to wrap it up. It's, uh, for years, I've been working with people collaborating from every which way. And I found that if I have a good working relationship, like who wrote what isn't as important as the relationship, you know? It's sort of like John Lennon released his song The Ballad of John and Yoko while he was being sued by Paul McCartney. He was just so used to putting Paul McCartney's name on his songs as 50% owner and co-writer 
that even though he was being sued by the guy and being taken to court, he was still like Paul McCartney wrote half of this. And so there's a spirit of generosity that happens that I want to talk to you about in collaborating where 100% of nothing is nothing. 50% of something is a lot more than you have now. So as a person who's spent a lifetime and made lots of money and had hits because I'm willing to share the pie with people is don't be stingy or greedy. You know, if you write one good song, that's not going to be it. Like if you're talented, you're going to write another one and another one and another one. So don't hold on to your first one like, you know, me, me, me. Like, like be willing to get in the river and swim, which is how you got to get, you got to give to get and you got to get in and start working with people. You know, one of my best examples of people ask, how do I get in the business? And I say, you show up with a mop and broom and say, what do you need done? How can I help? You know, Russell Simmons does seminars and he says that there's a kid who showed up once at Def Jam and he just said, I'll work for free, I'll come earlier than anybody comes and I'll stay later than anyone stays. And he said within six months, this guy was the head of the promotion department. And then within a year, he was the senior vice president of Def Jam. And then he became the president of Def Jam. And now he's the chairman of the Warner Music Group. His name is Lear Cohen. And Lear started as Russell's assistant who just came in and swept up, and did all the jobs no one else wanted to do. And now he's the chairman of the world's biggest record company. So there's something in that idea of not what I can take from your situation and grab from it, but how can I show up and give to it that really opens the door for people. So that's all for now. That's a lot to think about. And we're going to next week just bring in your music. Bring in, like if you have a guitar, be willing to play the guitar next week. And if you have a CD, be willing to share it with us, because that's how you'll get really good um, feedback. And if you two guys collaborate on something, even if it's possible to play us something next week, it would be great for us to listen. And we're going to go over the lyrics, and we're going to start talking a little bit about um, lyrics, and then the idea of collaboration and production. We're going to listen to productions and, and why certain songs. There's a difference between a hit song and a hit record. And we're going to look at the two things and how Sometimes a song like Yeah by Usher, if I try to play it on the piano, it's going to suck. But with all the beats and with Little John rapping, it's suddenly it's a hit record. We're going to look at the difference between those two things. So thank you all very much.